Welcome to this afternoon's session on the supply chain. Uh, this is going to be a panel session. So again, like all of the panel sessions that we have uh, as part of this program, if you would like to take out your telephone and uh, use the conference app, and if you find the relevant session on your phone and collect, uh, click on the live Q&A, you'll be able to submit questions to uh, well, to the panel, and I shall get them in due course. Um, I would like to introduce our panelists one by one. So we have uh, to, to the, we have Talia Zamataro from uh, Vestas, the senior director of sales, and from uh, Vestas New Zealand. We have Peter Lumsden, general manager of offshore wind at Iberdrola. We have Hannah Maltwap. Head of Procurement for APAC RWE, Andy Ho, Head of Government and Regulatory Affairs for Ersted Australia, and Naveen Balakachara Chandra, and uh, Vice President, Renewable Energy Logistics, Asia Pacific for Kuhn and Nagel. Sorry, it's getting really late. My, uh, I feel like I'm doing tongue twisters here. Um, can you please make them welcome? <laughs> So, Talia, we'll start with you. Um, can you give the audience a little bit about your background personally and maybe how Vestas views the supply chain challenges or how the supply chain picture in Australia? Yeah, um, thanks, Stuart. Um, my background in wind is primarily offshore wind. Um, I started my wind career in Denmark 10 years ago. Um, and then you and I met each other at a company called MHI Vestas Offshore Wind, um, where I built, um, I was in the construction part of the business, um, building wind farms in Denmark and the UK. And then I moved to a service role for Denmark and Germany. Um, so I'm here in Australia, continuing my Vestas journey. Um, how Vestas Australia views um, the supply chain, um, I guess we will potentially be part of the offshore supply chain um, when it comes one day to Australia, um, which is something we view as a huge opportunity. Um, Vestas has a really large footprint of offshore wind turbines globally where we've installed so far, I think, over eight gigawatts of offshore wind turbines. So we are ready and willing to engage as, as an important part of the supply chain. But Vestas um, has, I think Australia is one of Vestas's largest markets, uh, at least in the APAC area, I'm not sure globally, but uh, so you already have a, a strong footprint in country. And maybe for the people that don't know the difference, can you utilise any of that footprint for the, uh, for the offshore work? I think there is, my own reflection, I thought I knew a lot about building wind turbines, and then I came back to Australia 10 months ago and realised Australia and navigating laws and rules and regulations and all the complicated um, and beautiful things about the Australian um, wind industry, whether it's onshore and it will become offshore, um, there is a lot of parallels there, and I think that local knowledge and, and the networks uh, will serve anyone well, whether it's onshore or offshore. Thanks. Peter? Hi, sure. Thanks uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, my name is Peter Lumsden. I'm general manager for Iberdrola Offshore, um, responsible for growing our offshore business here in Australia. Um, my background, I've been involved in the, the offshore industry now um, since 2007, um, primarily focused on the installation of projects. So most of my experience comes at the the other end of the project life cycle and constructing and, and delivering um, projects. Um, my most recent role was with Scottish Power, where I was our head of installation department, um, which has um, recently completed uh, installation of, of several offshore wind farms in Europe and also currently working in the USA with our, our vineyard project. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to be here and the opportunity to speak today. Thanks. I think we've heard from uh, many Iberdrola people over the, on the panels of uh, these sessions, so I think we've got a good idea of how Iberdrola is viewing the market. I think also Wholesale Data did a great uh, TED talk uh, yesterday morning as well to set the, really set the scene there. Um, Hannah, for yourself, what's your background and um, what's RWE's view of the uh, procurement situation in Australia? 
Yeah, so my name is Hannah Moltop. I'm uh, responsible for procurement in the APEC region for RWE. And before I have worked for other utilities, also for uh, procurement in different roles. And I was responsible for also APEC market and then also for some time for the US market. And so the question, how do we see the supply chain in APEC at the moment, in Australia at the moment? I think the supply chain is very much at the beginning at the moment, but we see, or I see great potential also in Australia, the Australian supplier to enter the market, because I think at the moment there's a really good situation to set up new facilities in the market, so I would say that's a good a timing for Australia to set up this offshore business. And then I think also there are a lot of suppliers already uh, in Australia who are uh, active in uh, familiar industries like oil and gas industry or also in the onshore business, and for them it would be more, diff more easy to, to enter the Australian market. So in general, we hope uh, and this will be our first focus to develop additional suppliers in Australia for the Australian market. Thanks, Hannah. Andrew, what about yourself and Ersted? Thanks, Stuart. Um, so I'm uh, Andy Ho. I'm the uh, Head of Government and Regulatory Affairs for uh, Orsted in uh, Asia Pacific in a department called uh, New Markets. And uh, I know Peter was trying to place me uh, when we were just talking about this. So I've been sort of bounced around, uh, around Brussels, around uh, our business in uh, the UK. Uh, and then move before moving to Asia Pacific as well, where uh, I've been in places like Taiwan and Japan, South Korea, and now into Australia. And I think, you know, part of this sort of new market team that we're in is to come in and kind of do a bit of this exploratory work and to also set, set up our initial business here. Um, and, you know, we're very excited by uh, Australia, but we do know that, you know, geographically it's very far away from the rest of the supply chain. Um, so we've needed to kind of go in big uh, with, with our approach. So we've gone in and filed for a giant uh, combined uh, project size of 5.6 gigawatts to try and get that buying power to try and induce uh, a lot of interest uh, for people to come to Australia. Um, we think so far, uh, you know, that there will be challenges ahead, but so far so good. I think we had our first supply chain event, for example, uh, in February, and we were able to attract about 400 expressions of interest off of that one session alone, which is a good indication, A, for Australian businesses and the interest uh, in the offshore wind sector to come in, uh, but also good for us as well, because then it starts the, a process for us to identify who we can work with, who we can grow together with as well. So uh, off to a good start, I'd say, but yeah, still some challenges ahead. So, yeah, and, and maybe Naveen, because there's a few uh, things I'd like to unpack there a little bit in a, in a, little, in a few minutes. Naveen. Yeah, uh, Stuart, thanks for the invitation, and it's been a great conference over the last two days. Uh, I'm Naveen, Naveen Balachandran. I work for Kunanagal. Uh, we're the largest sea and air freight forwarder. Uh, before Kunanagal, I used to work for Vestas for about 17 years. Started in India and then moved to, to Singapore uh, in the regional APAC office. And the last role I was was uh, heading business development for for Asia Pacific. Now, to to answer your question about how uh, about supply chain in Australia, I mean from from a logistics perspective, we don't see Australia to be a very strong supply chain established market for now. Uh, as you, as Andrew said, it's very far from rest of the markets, which is good for us because that means we get to move a lot of components from other parts of the world to Australia, more money, so that's good. And uh, but to be fair, uh, Australia is a fairly expensive market to build anything. So over the first few years, I would think that uh, most of the components is going to come from markets where there is an already established supply chain in place in Asia Pacific. And, uh, and also from Europe. So I would say there's still some time off for uh, a booming supply chain setup in Australia. Thanks, Naveen. So we have three developers on the, on the panel. We have a OEM and we have a logistics uh, company on the panel. So I think we can maybe get a nice, well-rounded uh, perception about some of the challenges that we're facing. And it's interesting that we have three developers and one OEM, which kind of signifies where we are at the, as a market at the moment. I think that's a good uh, picture of where we are. In terms of attracting uh, the supply chain in, a, in Australia, if we do a bit of a stock take, uh, what do each of you see as the current picture? Where are we? Are, are we considering building factories? What's the current status? I might start with you, Naveen, again. Maybe with Talia, because it's about factories, then we come from that area. Well, I mean, from in terms of the logistics. Let, let's, let's talk about logistics, right? I mean, uh, as I mentioned, Australia is not yet 
ready for setting up factories. Okay, there are other markets where there's a fairly established setup. So if, if we look at where the components are going to come from for Australia, we see markets such as South Korea, where they have a very strong offshore supply chain in place. We see maybe Taiwan, where there's already some setup for manufacturing for turbines, and, and maybe from the Euro. So when we, as such, factories, maybe not. But uh, you need to see, keep in mind, there's a lot of challenges when we talk of Australia. I think this morning, we, uh, yesterday and this morning, there was a discussion on regional collaboration and about local content and so on. If, if there's a, a local content requirement, I think that would be challenging not just for the OEMs, but also for the developers. Uh, Taiwan is a great example, where the local content requirement made it more expensive for the developers to put up their projects than to actually get the turbines from Europe. And that's coming from some of our colleagues in SGRE and investors. So I would say that once there's a critical mass for projects in Australia, then it makes a lot more sense to establish a fair amount of supply chain in place. Otherwise, I would say keep it some time off from now. Thanks. And we'll get into the local content requirements uh, a little bit later. Uh, Talia. Uh, again, in relation to building factories in Australia, um, probably not on the here and now, but how do you view the, the general the supply chain in Australia? I mean, from a, if you were to look at the way Vestas approaches these things globally, I think we, well, there's a lot of ambition in Australia. Um, and when that ambition can translate to an actual pipeline of projects where there's a real view of firm volume coming year on year on year on year, uh, then I think that starts to unlock uh, this investment potential, which we see when Vestas has visibility to demand. Um, we see we're opening factories we have in the UK, uh, Poland, Korea. So visibility to demand that unlocks that investment. Thanks. Then to the developers, uh, where are you going to get the components from? Yeah, I think your point on opening factories, it, it does not have to be a, a turbine factory to create local content and jobs and skills. So you, you need to focus first on where the, the strengths are, the existing strengths in Australia, and really where those key suppliers can pay part in the, the overall supply chain. You've got lots of capability here already that can be expanded upon and, and can grow with the industry as the, the industry grows. So for me, it's about focusing on where the strengths are in country and really helping those small to medium sized enterprises take part of, of this growth um, period that's, that's coming and encouraging that. Do you have some concrete examples from uh, of, of organisations or uh, areas that you're talking about specifically? Yeah, very much so. So um, I think I'll take reference to our vineyard project in Massachusetts, USA, um, where we've placed um, major APC contracts with, with main suppliers, but we've also built within that a, a buy local first requirement, whereupon the, the tier one contractor is obliged to first look at, at local supply chain um, before they, they buy component level from, from any other overseas area. And that's encouraged a, a lot of growth and a lot of investment in the, the areas. I think the other good example is around operations and maintenance, where we've created regional hubs for op operations and maintenance, which in turn creates economic growth far out with the, the boundaries of the ports. So it allows long-term investment um, for local companies to participate in, in the maintenance of the, the wind turbines and the supply of all of the components, the people, the goods that are required to, to upkeep it. So those are, are two, two good examples of opportunities that maybe don't require the enormous long-term investment of a, a turbine factory, but do create jobs and skills in the, the local regions. Thanks. Hannah? Yeah, so I think it's important um, 
that uh, the supply chain from Australia will come from the APEC region because I think Australia is also in competition with Europe and in Europe there's so, such big demand. So I think it's important that uh, Australia will focus on maybe uh, some parts which they can localize and I would expect, uh, as you said already, uh, of, uh, operation and maintenance part is something where they can enter in, where they fi will find local suppliers and then also uh, for steel structure, I think that's also another field. And for the grid and for the ONTRA part, I think there are great potential for Australian suppliers. But then these other parts, I think there should be the focus on getting this from other regions in, in APEC. Yeah. And Andy, you touched on a little bit about this before uh, also. So in terms of like direct supply chain versus indirect supply chain, do you see a difference there in, in stimulating this and these type of jobs? Or is that how you're viewing it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think what it is is that everyone has to pull the levers that they can pull in order to get uh, what, what we, and if we fully agree, we agree with people here, that you need to have a supply chain that is long-term. And what is long-term, it's, it's sustainable growth, it's organic growth. So, you know, we're, we're kind of really working away again at these low-hanging fruits, playing to your, you know, first strengths first, and then building it out from there. For, the, for us as a developer as well, the lever that we pull um, is something about the scale of what we're trying to induce as well. So, you know, when we think about, um, you know, uh, something about the order of one gigawatt a year, for example, well, if you have, you know, five gigawatts to build, that's five years worth of work for our suppliers and for our partners. And, you know, but that's only five years. You know, if you, I'm sure there must be someone doing accounting here, you know, if you try to depreciate the, the, the cost of a factory, you're probably going to do like a 15 year straight line depreciation, right? So you've got 15 years to kind of wind down and get your money back from, from a factory that you may be building. So where is the rest of that work going to be coming from? And in that respect, you do need to have the buying power of the state. So in the case of Victoria, nine gigawatts by 2040, but nine gigawatts in Australia, and, and you've probably heard this a lot, you know, uh, over the last two days, nine gigawatts is Australia, but Europe is 300 gigawatts, you know, but Asia itself is, you know, up and coming. There's about 100 plus gigawatts perhaps uh, in the pipeline there. So recognizing that bigger market that everyone can play in as well is, is the other levers to pull. So I think there's a, something a little bit for uh, Victorian government, for Commonwealth government, and then internationally to think about in terms of levers to pull. So when we look around the, the globe, and you've all mentioned this in some part, we see a lot of demand for a lot, uh, increasing all across the globe. Are there any markets that Australia can look to to emulate what's been successful in bringing a supply chain? How do we actually, is there a best practice that we can say, okay, if we could only take this model and bring it into uh, the APAC area, or there's enough similarities between this market and that market that actually it makes sense to do? I don't know if any of the panel has a, an opinion there. So I would yeah. say I think there's not really a market where to copy, but uh, for me, I think there are three aspects which are really important. And the first thing is a, a stable, visible, and long-term pro project pipeline which will attract suppliers to enter the market. And then the second thing is, I think, an auction regime where which enables developers and suppliers to earn money with, uh, with this business. And then the third thing is, I think, also a flexible uh, auction regime regarding local content so that really suppliers can decide on their own where it makes sense to have local factory and where it may more makes sense to bring uh, the, the components from their, uh, from their uh, production facilities for, from somewhere else. Sure. Uh, Andy, you were going to jump in there as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what I was going to say, oh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, but um, I think the thing that I was probably going to go for, no, I've completely <laughs> lost, sorry, my uh, thing started flashing on the screen. Um, yeah, you could give me a pass. Give okay. me a pass. <laughs> I'll come back to you, I'll come back to you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, Talia or uh, Naveen, any thoughts around that, uh, the best practices you've seen in other markets that you think would be relevant for Australia to follow? I mean, I, it's not inherently on the supply chain side of things, Stuart, but the, the, the infrastructure that's needed um, and a regional focus on that, and I mean, what comes to mind is, I think, a corner of Denmark that you and I know and love, probably, that Western... Western Danish Esbjerg area, which has transitioned itself um, over the years to become a European offshore wind hub and 
and they do it well. I mean, there's, it's probably one of my favourite parts of Denmark to visit, whether Vestas is loading turbines out of there or Siemens or Fred Olsen has got a vessel in harbour that they're doing sea fastening on, like that, that corner of Denmark and how they've harnessed the industry. And Esbjerg is the first place that comes to mind whenever you think about doing a project in that region. Um, they're doing it right. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, as I said, it's, yeah, there's a lot that can be learnt from all of the infrastructure that's been invested there to attract suppliers and all these other parts of the industry. Thanks. N Naveen, sorry, Naveen. Oh, maybe Andrew, you, did you rethink yeah, no, of your I thought? Finally, <laughs> finally remember my point. Um, I did see no, a little light bulb. With yeah, you no, I just, after I turned <laughs> the thing off. Um, and so I, th I think the thing to, to think about is... Um, well, what we've got best practice and we've got kind of practice to avoid as well. I, I, Naveen kind of touched on Taiwan uh, earlier as being a heavily prescriptive environment. And, and to kind of give you a bit more of an idea of that, it's uh, sort of an ex almost a very explicit order uh, for developers to then suddenly find 60% uh, of content across, I think, to over 25, maybe 27 uh, listed components. And that's basically trying to shoehorn uh, an industry into Taiwan where those capabilities may not exist. It may be uh, ultimately inorganic growth. And you know, talking about sustainable growth is hand in hand with saying organic growth as well. So I think what happened there is, you know, we've had contracts out to try and meet that requirement. Um, so we have had contracts out for uh, one of our wind farms, which is 111 positions or 111 turbines, 111 foundations and so on and so forth. Uh, so when you apply 60%, you know, uh, there we tried to go to market and then ultimately we were only able to receive six uh, of, of those components at the end of the day. So that kind of shows you that uh, shoehorning uh, a requirement in doesn't necessarily get you the right result. Uh, it was a very painful process. Uh, and still to this day, I think, you know, the, the number of suppliers for that component is still limited. Uh, so again, it won't necessarily generate a competitive uh, supply chain either. So this will take time and this will take a lot of support as well. It can't just be a, a sort of a blanket requirement. Where we've kind of seen better practice uh, could be, for example, in the state of New York, uh, where they've kind of come up with a, uh, a more sort of novel way where the state of New York themselves have come with a package. They've said, look, there's 300 million US dollars of state uh, government funding here. You as a developer, how are you best going to leverage that funding to raise the supply chain? How will you make best use of that? And we're going to assess all of you on how efficiently you may deploy those funds. I think that's a very novel way of thinking about the problem think, and approaching the issue of trying to grow an industry. It shows that there's a level of government commitment uh, in there. And then it also shows that, you know, the ingenuity of the developer to bring partners on board and again, to generate that, that more uh, sustainable growth in there. So it's really kind of demonstrated the, the full levers of everyone coming in as, as uh, we said earlier. So hopefully there'll be something like that you know, in, in Victoria, in Australia, or anywhere else around the world. I think that sort of uh, commitment from all parties, I think, is what we need. Thanks, uh, Naveen. Just before I get to you, uh, if anyone has any questions to the panelists, please uh, feel free to join the live Q&A. Uh, we have the iPad here ready to ask questions. Naveen. I mean, if you, if you look at what uh, they have nailed so far is actually getting government support and government commitment. We saw Minister Bone come this morning and very, very enthusiastic in trying to say how he would like to push offshore uh, projects here. But if you want to look at a market where they can emulate from, UK is a great market to look at. I mean, if you look at UK, the reason why it has done so well in terms of supply chain is because of two key things. One is uh, scale and the other one is visibility. So for any uh, supplier to actually come into that market and build an establishment and set up, you need to have visibility of the potential growth of that market and what you can get uh, from orders from that market and scale. If you don't have scale, then it makes it very difficult for a supplier to establish their market there because there's uncertainty on how much they can actually sell in that market. So, and Australia is really far from other countries, so you need to make sure that there's a very strong establishment in policy, which is pretty much there, but at the same time, scale and, and visibility of projects. So we've all sort of touched on the idea of having scale and secure pipelines and very visible targets. In Australia, we have 
not much of that. I mean, yes, Minister Bowen is great that Minister Bowen actually announced another couple of uh, zones that are going to open for consultation. That's fantastic and it's a great effort. Uh, the federal government hasn't come with targets yet. How do we navigate in the absence of federal, federal targets? What are some of the other criteria that we actually are encouraged by that we're seeing in the market? Uh, maybe we start with the developers again. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I mean, for the, the reason the developers here uh, are here um, are quite obvious. You, you've got a need in country to create the, the clean energy. Um, there's a will from government to, to back that up. And you've got a very strong economy that, that's, able to, that's able to support a, a long-term investment in a, a new region. Um, so those, those three factors allow developers like ourselves to, to invest confidently in, um, in a new region, and it also allows the supply chain that support us in other regions to come with us and to assist us on, on that journey of, of developing those projects. Sure, but I mean, you must be looking at the Australian context in, a, in comparison to what else is happening, particularly in the APAC market, in the same years that we're, that we're looking to install. And so it'd be interesting to see how you, how do you actually prioritise what's happening in one market where there might be uh, you know, very firm volume targets versus a market that has a lot of promise and showing potential, but doesn't have those targets in place yet. I'm, I'm not sure if that triggers any different train of thought. I think the strongest projects will prevail. So the, the projects that have the infrastructure to support them, that have the incentive schemes that, that make them viable, um, that have all of the, the key components that are required to create a strong project and a strong business case, will prevail and, and will create the opportunities. And I, I do believe that you have areas um, in Australia that will meet all of that criteria. And from the, the implementation statements that we're seeing in Victoria, you certainly have regional government back in to, to ensure that, um, that you achieve your objectives here. Yeah, it, it does seem that they are talking the right language, but it, they just haven't put a number on it yet. And I'm just wondering if, you know, how, how that actually plays out. Do you need that number or are there other factors? Hannah or uh, Andrew? So I think there has to be a two-way uh, two strategy. So first of all, of course, it's important for Australia to set up also local suppliers, and I see them for, for some components, which we already discuss, discussed about. But I think then also they will need uh, for other components, like for turbines, for maybe for gables, uh, the international suppliers. And I think for this, it will be important to make it very easy for them to, to deliver to Australia. So I think the more entry barriers they will have, uh, the more unattractive it will, it will be to come to Australia. So I think the recommendation is to make it very easy to ship everything here, not to have any tax uh, uh, additional penalties or so. so and, and I am sure if, uh, if it will be easy to, to deliver here, then also suppliers will be interested in the Australian market. Great, thanks. So that actually ties into a question we've just got as well. But uh, Andrew? Um, it, I think it was just say the, the thing with Australia that, that has gotten everyone excited, that has had 40 applications gone in, I, I think is, you know, a lot of this is down to the Victorian government as well. You know, they've set up their own uh, bespoke, you know, offshore wind uh, team. I know the Commonwealth as well also have their own uh, offshore renewables team, which is now growing. Uh, but they've set themselves the, the, the timelines to talk about things, the commitments to say, okay, like, like this year there's going to be three implementation statements. We're all eagerly actually awaiting the last one for this year to really give us a bit more definition actually in terms of how the, uh, the energy is going to be procured by, by the Victorian government. So, um, and those commitments, they follow through. You know, they have given us um, those timelines. They've respected that. And, they've, and, you know, it means that we can keep coming back to the table to continue discussions to really talk about the idea of having flexibility in the supply chain, to have a budget commitment as well, to, to really make sure uh, that, you know, even if the other states, you know, don't have a target together, well, actually, what is the total um, commitment from the Victorian government side or the Commonwealth government side to, to really support offshore wind? Uh, and for us to be able to continue to go in and talk about these levers that, that need to be pulled, I think, you know, the engagement there has been very high. Uh, and I think the, the response has, has also been very, very genuine. That has really helped us to go in. And, you know, we were in a, a meeting with some other governments as well very recently where we said, look at what Australia is doing. Look at the transparency at what they're offering uh, to developers, to suppliers alike, to have these discussions. We'd very much want to see that as best practice in the rest of uh, the Asia-Pacific markets so that we can actually all grow together. 
So a question from uh, Mike Schiffs is, uh, do you see, and this is to maybe Talia and uh, Naveen to start with, do you see an opportunity for modularization of components to allow easier sourcing and transportation? And could assembly centers be an alternative to fully fledged factories? We start with you. We start with the logistics, yeah. the transport, the money, guys. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at talking about modularization, right? It it of course has an impact in making things easy when you're moving components from one country to the other country, and which which we have seen in the wind industry in the past, where the components were much smaller and they were not actually put in in one setup. But over the years, we have seen that a lot of modularization was done, which has brought down the cost of logistics to a large extent. Uh, how, whether that would actually work in Australia's favor, I would say yes. Uh, would it uh, make Australia be one of having a setup of factories and supply chain in place? I would say that we have to still wait and see. Talia, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, I know Vestas has adopted a modular uh, modularization strategy for their onshore turbines, and I, I, have, I guess it's the same in the offshore space. The way that we look at modularization, and I think looking at the V236, that's a really big nacelle, um, and the way it's designed, you can kind of tack bits on the side or off. Um, that's important serviceability-wise. Um, in terms of components first arrival or the like the components you're looking at something like the blades they're going to be the length that they are and they're really big things um, and i get where this question is coming from about the modularization however any modularization that you would do to streamline transport and logistics comes with some handling at the end um, whether it becomes double or triple handling, and that inevitably will become a cost in um, and introduce potential other risks to the supply chain, add time as well. So what the right approach is, I think, really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't know if modularization is part of the solution. Okay, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think um, I agree totally um, in respect to the turbines. Um, However, if we, we look at foundations and we look at the existing capacity within um, the fabrication supply chain in Australia, quite simply, it does not exist at a scale that's capable of delivering what's needed to, um, to meet the, um, the targets that have been set, even in the state of Victoria, far less um, beyond. Um, so if, if we take a, a deeper look at that, I would say it's, it's probably essential that we, we have that capability, that modular delivery of components, certainly for the first generation of projects, to allow the industry to get on its feet and to start establishing the, the supply chain that's needed to produce the, the much larger scale. So I, I do think that's a, a good question, and I, I think it's a strategy that will need to be deployed to, to meet the targets that are currently set. Thanks. Hannah, do you have a pers perspective about that, the modularization component? Modularization of components, rather? So I think maybe especially for, for, for floating, this could be a good idea because I think uh, especially these floating structures, uh, I would say they are very complex. So if, you, if it would be possible to have their modularized, modularized uh, concept, I think this would help, of course, uh, to, first of all, to bring down the costs and then also to find more, maybe more some parts which we could also localize, yes. Andy, do you want to weigh in on that one as well? Yeah, I mean, just, just a quick thought. I mean, I'm, I'm not a procurement guy. I'm a government guy. So the, when, when I heard modularization, I actually just actually thought, uh, isn't the wind farm itself just built in modules anyway? You know, you have the nacelle, the rotor, the blades, the tower, the foundation piece, et cetera. Aren't they all just kind of separate components? But I think the point that I would try to make is, well, yes, that's kind of already what's happening, right? You don't need everything. You don't need the entire capability to come uh, in, in one place, and if you kind of try to extrapolate this a little bit, you don't need all of the facilities to, to uh, exist in Victoria, and then only for New South Wales to then suddenly replicate the exact same setup and so on and so forth. It would be you know, very costly uh, and very uh, inefficient, and ultimately, again, unsustainable inorganic uh, uh, growth that, that you're getting here. So you wanna go for that low-hanging fruit. So where those modules already exist in other parts of the world, well, bring some of that in. Uh, and where you've kind of got a shortfall or where there's something already going on in Australia, well, you know, improve the, improve the, the, the rate of production, let's say, for that. 
and build it from there. You know, so that, that was my, in my head what modularity would mean. If we look at some of the local content rules that we see around the world, and you've, we've mentioned some of them already, what, what's happened in the US and what's happened in Taiwan and also uh, the UK, we also have seen some governments come with incentives to actually help stimulate this, like the UK sector deal, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. How does this panel view those type of incentives and does Australia need to bring anything like that to the table to help stimulate the supply? Yeah, yeah I think uh, the important thing I take from the UK sector deal is not the 60% target, it's the collaboration that's been happening between government and industry to create those opportunities. To, well, firstly, to identify the opportunities for businesses, for local content, and then to assist in, in realising all of those opportunities. So the focus is, is not on the figure, it's on the collaboration between industry and government and how we can collectively um, determine the, the best route forward to, to achieve the objectives for everyone, which ultimately is to create jobs and skills and economic growth in region. Yeah, I know that uh, the Australian government have been thinking about uh, maybe looking at an OWIC type of model to, to what we could do here in Australia to help sort of, uh, I guess, straighten those type of conversations up a little. Uh, anyone else have an opinion about these uh, incentives, uh, Hannah? Yes, yeah, so I think uh, the more local content requirement, the more complicated it will, it will be. So I think it's better to work with uh, support on investment. So to, uh, I think what we would, would like to wish is to have a very flexible local content regime. And then really, I think what would help local suppliers to invest or also international suppliers to come here to invest in factories is support on the investment. I think that's a better strategy than to force suppliers to have a certain amount of local content. And if this is then maybe not coming by nature because uh, some, somehow the suppliers are not there or the facilities are not there, I think this will not really help. This will only bring costs, uh, bring, bring, bring us to higher costs. Yeah, thanks. Levine? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, going back to local content, uh, agree with Andy here. If it is as pres prescriptive as it is in Taiwan, it is going to completely de be a different for the growth of the industry. When I talk about incentives, I think uh, almost all industries uh, that started for the first time, let's talk about onshore wind, when it started off, it had some form of incentive to grow and now it is without any incentives, right? So there needs to be a form of incentive if you want to see a fast track growth in a country like Australia, which will not only have uh, OEMs like Vestas, but also developers like RWE and Ibrodrola have a lot more interest in that market. So I'm not sure what kind of incentive mechanism should be there, but I do promote that there should be one for a certain period of time and then phase it out and then let it run its own course. Talia, do you have any uh, anything to say around the, the incentives from government? The thing I like about that sector deal, linking to what Peter said, is that it also talks about infrastructure investment um, and unlocking that, again, links back to, I know I'm mentioning ports and harbours again, but it's kind of an obsession of mine. Um, <laughs> But, Doesn't happen without them. <laughs> yeah, and that's critical, and I like that that yeah, talks to infrastructure investment. Uh, you need a cohesive approach. You need a plan on that. Uh, Andy, I'm not sure if Ersted's got anything to say on that as well. I mean, I mean just fully, I fully agree with what everyone is saying here, that you need to have the, actually the, the incentives. We've worked actually in previous years with diff in different markets where instead of having an incentive, it was a penalty-based kind of way of, th of thinking about the world. But now you've seen the US come out with the massive incentive, you know, and, and actually I think I, I said this uh, the other day in a, in a different audience where we know that this is an energy uh, priority, you know, that decarbonisation is, is really to do with the energy sector, but actually you've also got to bring in other ministries, other departments, so it's not just your departments of energy, you've actually got to bring in your trade ministry, you've got to bring in your, your treasury, your department of finance as well to come into these conversations, and I get the sense that's probably what they did in the States, you know, so what's the sort of equivalent response for, for Australia as well? You know, can we have a discussion about 
uh, about a budget? Or can we have a discussion about a response to the US Inflation Reduction Act? You know, I think those are all things that, that need to happen here in order for us to, to, to look at Australia and not kind of keep having our head ripped towards the US. So yeah, I, I think you know, it's a wider conversation. We, we have one final question uh, that's just come in from Amin. Um, what are the challenges and opportunities for increasing turbine sizes, and how does the supply to, how can the, the supply chain reduce costs while keeping up with the big trajectory of size increases? I guess this is something that you guys are forecasting already. What type of turbine is going to be the first turbine installed in uh, 2028 or 2030 or whenever we have to steel in the water in Australian waters? I won't come to you for this one, Talia, because uh, everyone wants to know the, 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 what's the next biggest turbine, but maybe some what of What do the, you want to buy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe some of the developers, if you have an idea about the, how, how we deal with the, the uh, turbine size and how we uh, actually can, uh, does that put upward pressure on the costs, uh, having larger and larger uh, turbines? I mean, the, for, I mean, without sort of getting into the spreadsheet and, and kind of breaking that out, that there's, there is a crossover point where when you get a larger size, it does reduce the cost of other things you know, in terms of your installation packages and, and, and so on and so forth. We do read the news, we see that, you know, there, there's a, a sort of a call there to pause the development, but I, I think the thing to also think about is if you pause the sort of the growth of the turbine, you also pause the amount of uh, clean energy that will go into the system from, from your wind farm as well. So it's not just about the sort of nameplate capacity, it's also about the blade dimensions as well and how much wind it captures, et cetera. And we're all about that as well. You know, we really do want to maximize the amount of green power that can go into, into Victoria in this case. Um, so we have uh, a range of cases uh, that we have considered for Australia and uh, you know they, they can range from the things that you can imagine today to actually some really forward thinking uh, sizes as well. So not, not just in the sort of 10 plus category, um, but I'll stop, I'll stop there. Thanks. No, you, you yeah. want I mean, to come in? When, when we talk about the sizes of turbines and how it's going to be over the coming years, I, I mean the, the biggest that we see potentially from a logistics point of view could be around 20, 20 megawatt class turbines, but uh, you can't talk just turbines for supply chain because with turbines you have vessels and with vessels you have ports. So all three needs to be spoken about when we talk about how big the turbine sizes can go. And because there's only a certain point of time where the turbine sizes can go up to where the ports can take and the vessels can take because each of those have to also get bigger. Right, and uh, in today's times, and if, if I look at uh, the GVEC report on offshore that released early this week, we are talking about 380 gigawatts of uh, offshore uh, wind uh, projects coming up by 2032. Now, let's break that into numbers. That equates roughly around 19,000 turbines of 20 megawatt class. Yeah, that's, that's a very big number. Yeah, so in order for, I doubt it'll reach that 19,000 megawatt, it could be lower uh, in, in terms of uh, size. But having said that, the, what I'm trying to drive home is that port and vessels are key discussion items when we talk about how big the sizes of turbines can be. I think that sounds like a, an overwhelming takeaway from the, the, the panel. We need to fix our ports and vessels. We need to work out what we can do to stimulate the supply chain and, and, and the other areas and the skills and that we're going to need to, uh, to make this industry thrive. We are almost out of time. We've got about a, a minute or two left. I'd really love for each of the panelists to maybe share a reflection if, if uh, what is the first step that we can do today or what's the first step that we have to do today to ensure that uh, Australia can actually build wind turbines when we need them? That policy to support the industry uh, is, is enacted as soon as possible. Thanks, Tony. I think the award of the feasibility licence to a suite of experienced developers um, with the, the capability to deliver the, the projects and supported by a, a low-risk government-backed incentive scheme is what's required. Thanks, Peter. Hannah? So I'm from procurement and my focus are the suppliers and I really would like to invite all Australian suppliers to think about 
can they enter our offshore business? And uh, I think it might be a long way for them, but I think it, because it's a long way, it's good to decide today to think about where they can do this. And we would really like to support and encourage all Australian suppliers to do this because I think we need them. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I, I think you know some of the first steps have already been taken with, with these applications, and 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 I think for us, we're not just waiting for for this Victorian final offshore wind implementation statement. We'd really hope to see a, a few more again tools and levers being pulled from the Commonwealth government, a few more budget discussions as well, because I think that will help Australian businesses really consider well what can they do uh, in this environment. So yeah, I think we're just waiting for for a few more docu documents to come out about industry. And Naveen, the final yeah. word. Now, I've got, uh, I've got a government relations uh, response to that. Uh, national offshore wind target. Right now, it's the Victoria state that's actually come up with a target. If you, if you have a national wind offshore target, that in a way gives visibility to developers and OEMs to know that the government is committed not just in one state, but across the country. So there is a potential that it will be that big. It's not just a promise, but it's a promise that might translate to reality. Thank you. So thank you to those that have submitted questions to help us uh, keep this panel interactive. Could you please thank our panelists? Thank you very much, everyone.